Welcome to week three of Daniel's Dilemma. You guys excited to get into the Word this morning? Yeah, me too, me too. Thank you so much. I love, love this time of the week where we can come together. I, I truly believe that every time we go to God's Word, every time we go to Scripture, the Lord is speaking to us. And so I'm excited to hear what He has to tell us this morning. If you're just joining us, uh, we're in week number three of a, of a four-week series called The Daniel Dilemma, where we've been centering our conversation around a, a really profound question. It's just, how do we stand firm and love well in a culture of compromise? Week number one, if you were with us, we talked about grace and truth and how it was really possible to balance those two things well. Standing firm in our convictions as Christ followers, but also how to love people really well. We saw this, it was perfectly balanced in the person of Jesus, because we saw that Jesus forgave us just like we are, just like he found us, but he calls us to more, he calls us to grow according to our standards. We kind of set this bar as a church family, that we were going to hold high God's word, we were going to stand for his truth, because his truth never changes, but that we were going to freely give God's grace, just like he gave it to us. And last week we talked about the Babylon mindset. We talked about how Babylon was more than just a location where all of these stories in the book of Daniel took place. We talked about it being a mindset, a flawed and a confused way of thinking that elevated God or elevated man and lowered God. And we talked about how important it was for us to live God-honoring lives. So instead of worshiping ourselves or making a big deal about ourselves, that we were gonna exalt God with lifestyle worship. We were gonna acknowledge God that we needed him. We were gonna depend on him. And probably most importantly, that we were gonna humble ourselves before God with a lifestyle of submission. We were gonna flip that script and elevate God and lower ourselves. But for the next two weeks, we're gonna spend our time each week talking about one of these two things. We're gonna go in depth on what does it mean to stand firm in our convictions and beliefs And next week, we're going to talk about what it means to love well and really have influence on culture. So today, we're going to talk about what it really means to stand firm. What does it mean to live a stand-up life? The Apostle Paul talked about this, actually, to the church of Corinth. He said this, be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, and do everything with love. There's the call right there. Stand firm in the faith, but learn how to love well. Standing firm, it means standing strong in your faith despite the path that culture would want you to take. It means standing for what's right despite what society might be telling you, might be telling you that you're wrong for what you believe. If you're like me, you probably feel this pressure many times, this pressure of praying in public, like all eyes are on you, or having a a, a deep spiritual conversation in a public space, or talking about God with others at work or at school. And we see it often, that the chances of us experiencing something like this are really, really slim, but we see it, or we read about it in the news, where we see our brothers and sisters in Christ who live on the other side of the world facing very serious persecution for their beliefs as they stand firm in their faith. We feel this growing pressure in culture, don't we? I listen to the news or I'm listening to podcasts and we, f- we feel this. We feel this growing tension in our society. As Christ followers, we face this pressure as we try to walk out our faith well, how to do this faith thing well in a culture that just seems to continually move farther and farther away from God. And I'd say this, it takes men and women of courage. It takes men and women of deep faith to influence culture. Uh, Many of you may have read some of his work, but there was a a Lutheran pastor during the reign of Nazi Germany named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Anyone know that name? 
amazing man of, of just sound convictions. And so often during Nazi Germany's reign, as trains were rolling people to the concentration camps, the churches would play their organ music, music louder so that they wouldn't hear the trains roll past. And he stood out and he said, this is wrong. This is wrong. And he was executed for his beliefs. And tomorrow we're going to celebrate, I think, one of the most important men in American history, and Dr. Martin Luther King. He stood up for what he believed. It takes men of, and women of great courage and great faith to impact culture and do so without compromising godly standards. How to stand firm and love well in a culture that compromises. So we're in the book of Daniel. It's been a great couple of weeks so far. I've enjoyed going back to these stories. There's a couple of just profound accounts in the book of Daniel of how to stand firm. And we're going to look at one of those accounts today. It's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the fiery furnace. And if you grew up in Sunday school or you grew up watching Veggie Tales, many of us know this story. But let's look at this story with fresh eyes and more importantly, fresh hearts as we learn what happened to them on the day they decided to stand firm in their faith. Would you stand with me this morning as we go to Scripture and honor God's Word together? It's been a few weeks since we've done this. We're going to read seven verses out of Daniel chapter 3 to get us started this morning. Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. It reads, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide. That's about 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. And set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he summoned the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will be immediately thrown into the blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, Lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all nations and all peoples of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Let's pray together over our time in God's word. Lord, thank you so much for this time just in your presence. A chance for us to quiet our hearts, to slow down for just a few moments and hear what you have to say to us. And my prayer right now is that you just meet each and every one of us exactly where we're at that you'd help us learn this amazing principle of what it looks like to stand firm and love well in a, just a, a culture that moves continually farther and farther away from you. And my specific prayer this morning, Lord, is that your voice would be the loudest in the room, that we'd hear what you have to say to us today through your word. It's with open hearts and open spirits that we say this all in your name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Why don't you fist somebody today before you have a seat? Tell them, go Pats. Big game today. What's going on? Oh, I'm getting hugs today? There we go. Awesome. Another hug? Awesome. Thank you. I did. I wore blue and red today to honor my patriots today. I know that makes me an enemy for many of you. The stand firm. That's good. That was fantastic. I was telling someone earlier there was a, a with the Wikipedia uh, entry for the AFC Championship game was edited this week. Earlier this week, it read uh, the AFC Championship game is the is the title game for the American Football Conference between two teams to battle for the right to go to the Super Bowl. And it was edited this week to read is the game between the New England Patriots and one other team to battle for the right to go to the Super Bowl. <laughs> It's like, that person is my friend. <laughs> Standing firm in a culture of compromise. I love this scene in scripture. I love this 
account that we have here in the book of Daniel. I really wish I could have seen this play out. This mass of people standing before this giant gold statue and the sights and the sounds and seeing the, all of the, the nation of Babylon and other nations, their leadership standing before this, this, uh, this statue and the country takes its cue and falls but to the ground in worship. I wish I could have seen this stand out because I wish I could have seen what it looked like to have these three young men refuse to bow down and stand up for their beliefs. There somewhere in the middle of the crowd, I imagine they're kind of, you know, two thirds of the way back right in front of the soundboard. That's funny, come on. Three young Hebrew men, the best and the brightest that the nation of Israel had to offer, the influencers of Hebrew culture, standing there despite everybody else bowing around them, refusing to bow down. Daniel 3 continues in verse 12. There were uh, some of Nebuchadnezzar's advisors, these heralds and all these leaders that we heard about, went back and they told Nebuchadnezzar, said, there's some Jews whom you've set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you've set up. And the Bible doesn't say that they made a scene or that they yelled or, you know, they protested. Instead, they just chose to stand and refused to bow down. And I think what we see is Nebuchadnezzar reacting the way that probably a lot of us imagine culture reacts. He reacts just like the world often reacts when we refuse to bow down and worship the things they tell us to. He gets furious, doesn't he? Look at verses 13 and 14. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? How often do we see that kind of response from culture? This outrage culture, can I say it that way? It's so quick to be toxic. Culture says worship the things we worship, worship our image, value what we value. And if you don't believe what we believe, value what we value, you hate me and I hate you. And I think this is one of the spaces in culture where we can have influence. We can disagree, but we can still stand firm and love well. We can counter this outrage culture. Nebuchadnezzar pulls these guys aside and he says in verse 15, I'll give you one more chance, just one more chance. When the music plays, if you fall down and worship that statue, all will be well. But if you refuse, but if you refuse, that's the dilemma, isn't it? That's the tension that's the point of conflict. It's why we're talking about this story. We talked about week one and how one of the cultures that, one of the tactics that culture uses against us is that culture eventually is going to force a confrontation. There's going to be a clash of values between what we believe and what culture believes. And we said many of us feel unprepared for moments like that. If you're like me, many times you don't know how you should respond in those moments of confrontation? How often do we find ourselves in those moments where we feel this tension inside of us that says, I, I, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna compromise my beliefs. We feel in those moments this tension where we know that our spirit is calling us to walk away or to not give in to the pressure, but we don't know what to do. It's the dilemma. How do we respond well in those moments to a culture that changes and doesn't have the same standards that we do. But if you refuse, you will be thrown into a flaming furnace within the hour. And then despite their Hebrew God and what God can deliver you out of my hands then. I think it's one of the tactics that gets used against us so often. It's fear, right? It's fear if you refuse and then a threat. 
I think our spiritual enemy tries to evoke this fear response in us to try and quiet that voice inside of us that says, stand firm, stand firm. Those voices, sometimes that self-monologue, the deceptive talk that we hear in those moments says things like, well, they're going to laugh at you. You take this stand and they're going to laugh at you. Or they're going to start thinking about you differently. They're going to exclude you. You'll be the outsider. In the extreme, what do we hear in those moments of confrontation? You're a bigot or you're a hater. In the moment, it's so easy to get intimidated and cave into that pressure. It's easy to back down as opposed to standing firm. This is why we're talking about this. How do we stand firm and yet still love well? How do people not see us, but instead see this God that we serve who loves them so completely, but still maintain our standards and not compromise? I think it's going to take a few things from us as Christ followers. The first is this. It's going to take courage. It's going to take courage to stand up for the things we believe. And courage is not the absence of fear. Courage isn't the absence of fear. Instead, courage is actually recognizing what's causing the fear and resolving not to bow down to it. It's something that rises up inside of us. It's a, it's a boldness. It's a confidence. It's a faith that stems from knowing exactly who we are and who we serve. Look at how these guys responded in Daniel 3.16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not worried about what will happen to us. We got 99 problems, but Nebuchadnezzar ain't one. <laughs> That's my favorite joke today. I don't care what you guys think. That's my absolute favorite joke today. <laughs> I cracked myself up. <laughs> Listen, these young men were not stupid. They were not naive. They knew exactly what was going to happen to them. They knew the king meant what he said. They knew that this was, an, can I say it this way, an actionable, credible threat. They knew the king would follow through on this. And I absolutely think that they were afraid. Absolutely, without a doubt in my mind, that they were afraid. But something inside them rose up as they took a stand for their beliefs. It gave them the courage, the confidence, the boldness to confront the compromise. In our culture of compromise, I think one of the tactics that's used against us is just that relentless pressure to back down. Just back down. Voices will come loudly when we take a stand. And those loud voices will tell you you're insensitive or you're out of touch or you're out of date, you're irrelevant, you're being offensive. And it's a tactic to get you to simply cave to your fears. And most time, I would say this, it's the path of least resistance. It's the easiest path. But we're not called the easy. We're not called to take the easy out. What does the self-talk start sounding like? Okay, I'll, I'll compromise just this one time. I'll back down this one time. It's okay. I'll love them a different way rather, rather than making this stand. We're not called to do what's easy. We're called to do what's right. Because we're going to hold high God's truth. It's who we are. Courage isn't the absence of fear. Courage is standing firm in the face of fear. So standing firm, it takes courage. It also takes faith. Standing firm takes faith. Faith, like we defined it earlier this fall, faith is confidence and trust that God is with you. God is for you. You trust him. You believe in him. It's confidence that God is on your side. It's trust that he's going to deliver you out of that situation. It's confidence that no matter the consequence of what you're standing firm is, that he's going to be there to help you through that situation. Faith is confidence that you're not standing alone. 
These guys keep going on in verse 17. If we're thrown into the flaming furnace, our God is able to deliver us. He will deliver us out of your hand, your majesty. But if he doesn't, it's almost like a mirror of his words, right? But if he doesn't, these young Hebrew men, they knew who they were and they knew who God was. And they had confidence that God was on their side. They understood, can I say it this way, that they were in a win-win situation. They were in a win-win situation. God shows up and delivers them, they win. And guess what? If God shows up, and they, or if God doesn't show up, and they stand firm in their faith, and God brings them home, they win. You can't mess with someone if they know they're in a win-win situation, Right? They have all the power in that situation. Peter would say it this way. This world's not our home. We're just travelers. We're just passing through. We're sojourners. So we're going to go through hard things. And even if we go through hard things, we know where we're going. Paul says it this way. Talk about setting the bar incredibly high. Paul says to live is Christ and to die is gain. He knew exactly what the win-win was. But even if he doesn't, please understand, sir, that even then we will never under any circumstance serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have erected. I love that they called him sir in that moment. They honored the position. They didn't yell at him. They didn't scream at him or curse at him. No matter what you might do to us, we're not going to compromise our standards. They took a stand that required faith. I'll say it this way. If we don't stand for something, we'll fall for anything. If we don't understand who we are, and if we don't understand who we are in the God that we serve, we will fall for anything culture throws at us. Understanding who we are in Christ gives us the foundation we need in life to build everything else upon. And I think that's the, probably the biggest key to understanding how to stand firm. We don't have to hate culture. Can I say that again? We don't have to hate culture. We don't have to be a people that are known for what they're standing against. We don't hate people groups. We don't hate opposing political parties. We don't hate people who do bad things. We don't hate people who post ridiculous, stupid things on Facebook. We just unfollow them. <laughs> The stance is based on our identity in God. I love God, and he loves me. We take a stance because we love God. We will honor him. We will hold high his truth. Here's the rest of the story in Daniel 3. Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and his face became dark with anger at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He commanded that the furnace be heated up seven times hotter than usual and called for some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the fire. So they bound, him with, bound them with tight ropes and threw them into the furnace fully clothed. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames leaped out and killed the soldiers as they threw them in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell down, bound into the roaring flames. But suddenly, as he was watching, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we throw three men into the furnace? Didn't we throw three men into the furnace? Yes, they said, and we did indeed, your majesty. Well, look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire, and they aren't even hurt by the flames. And the fourth looks like a god. What just happened? In theological terms, this is called a theophany or a Christophany. Do you know what that means? It means Jesus showed up. Jesus showed up in this moment. We don't fully understand what happens, but from time to time throughout the story of Scripture, and these are mostly in the Old Testament, we see these moments where Jesus appears. Oftentimes you'll see uh, the angel of the Lord appeared. 
uh, or, or wording that's similar to that. It's this moment where Jesus, before the incarnation, comes to earth and intervenes. This is one of those moments. Jesus appears to humanity before his birth in Bethlehem, and he appears and he intervenes on behalf of these boys. He came and he stood up for them. And in like my little cartoon bubble in the little corner of my mind, like I, I see like the father and Jesus watching this scene unfold and Jesus saying like, hold my sacramental grape juice. I'll be right back. <laughs> That's my second best joke for today. So if you don't find it funny, sorry. But Jesus appears and he intervenes on behalf of these boys. He came and he stands up for them. And Daniel keeps, keeps going in verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the open door of the flaming furnace. And he yelled, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Now look at this. Servants of the Most High. Hey, look who found religion. I was just fooling. Your God is awesome. That cracks me up. Servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So they stepped out of the fire. Then the princes, governors, capt captains, and counselors crowded around them and saw that the fire hadn't touched, him, touched them. Not a hair of their heads was singed. Their coats were unscorched. And they didn't even smell of smoke. I love this. Listen, watch this. You can take a stand for God and not have culture affect you. We don't have to isolate from culture out of fear. We can be right in the middle, right in the fire of culture. Talk about being in the world and not of it, right? We talked about that last week. And not have, us, have it touch us. It's completely possible to stand firm in our convictions. And when we do so well, culture can't touch us. But standing firm takes courage. Standing firm takes faith. And when you do, standing firm inspires others. The tactic in getting you to cave into your fears and not stand out sounds like this. If you, if you take a stand, if you take a stand and do this, people will hate you for it. They'll hate you for it. But some of my experiences said when you take a stand, even if trials come, which we know as we read through the story of Scripture, trials will come. When you take a stand, people will actually love you for it. They want to know what you're for. Because we're not going to be known for what we're against. We stand with what we're for. We stand for something. We don't have to get goofy with our faith and how we walk this out. We're going to talk about that next week. How do we do this? How do we love well? We're going to talk about that next week, but we need to take a stand or say it this way. We need to start taking a stand and expanding God's territory and pushing back the forces of darkness in this world. We need to take a stand. We need to take a stand. I sound like Cameron from Ferris Bueller. I got to take a stand. <laughs> That was my best joke. <laughs> Can I have a Ferrari right behind me? <laughs> we got to take a stand. If you, haven't, if you don't do this yet, you need to. Parents, you need to pray over your kids and take a stand over your kids before you send them to school because they're walking into darkness. What if you took a chance and stood and prayed with your coworkers? What might happen if you took a stand and prayed with your coworkers? Ladies, ask that other group of moms that you're with if there's anything that they need, or any way that you can serve them, any way that you can pray for them, and not just pray for them, but actually have the boldness to pray with them right then in that moment. Every single place you set your feet you're a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everywhere you go, you're on the job. Because when people know what you're standing for and they see you making a difference and loving well, you're going to inspire them. You're going to inspire them to ask questions like, what's, what's different about you? 
Daniel 3 keeps going on. And Nebuchadnezzar says to them, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him. I love that Nebuchadnezzar finds religion and starts talking about himself in the third, talking about himself like in, in the third person, like it was somebody else that was in this scene and he just showed up. They trusted him and defied the king's command and they were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own. Therefore, I decree that people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut to pieces. <laughs> I guess he was saved, but he wasn't that saved yet. <laughs> maybe, maybe he needs a life group and needs some seasoning. They'd be cut into pieces and their houses be burned and turned into piles of rubble for no other God can save this way. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So why are we talking about all this? What does it matter if we take a stand or not? Can't I just go my own way and do my quiet Christian life thing? You, you do you? That's good. God's highest calling for you is to make a difference. God's ca highest calling for you is to make a difference in this world. It's why we do this whole church thing. It's not only for God's people to gather together and worship, but that's part of it. We're called to help people far from God find life in him. We're called to help people who are far from God find this fully devoted, Christ-following, disciple kind of life. We're called to make a difference in the lives of the people around us by being the example of who Jesus is to them, by standing firm and loving well, doing those two things in balance. But how can they see Jesus in us if we look the same as everybody else? And there's the tension. We're not called to blend into the shadows or fade into the noise. We're called to be a light to the world that darkness can't overcome. We're called to be a city on the hill so that everyone can find refuge and safety and forgiveness and wholeness. We're called to help people connect to God and connect to us as a church family because there's room at God's table for everyone. We're called to grow together to become more and more like Jesus and we're called to go and make a difference in this world. If we look and sound and act and think like culture, and what's culture screaming at everyone? There's no standards. Make your own truth. You do you. If we look and sound and act and think like culture, we won't wind up standing up for anything. Nothing about us will point people to Jesus and nothing will distinguish us from the rest of culture. So we have a choice when it comes to culture. We can be a voice speaking into culture instead of being an echo from it. Let's go back to the big thought of the day. It's really the key about standing firm. We're standing for something, not against something. We don't have to focus on what we don't like about culture. We don't have to be those people. I think it's one of the flaws of the lists of, can I say it this way, the don't behavior list. Because kids automatically are gonna do what they shouldn't do. They don't need to be taught wrong behavior parents said amen. It's part of our wiring. It is natural for us to be sinful. It's part of the brokenness of humanity. It's natural, natural for us to be sinful. We're rebel rebellious because of our sinful nature. So we're not going to list the things that we're against. We're going to need lists of things that we're for. Can I say it this way? Take that rebellious nature that's inside of us and turn it for God. Culture is screaming at you to not touch being a Christian. So like in my rebellious streak, you know what I want to do? Boop. Just want to just watch culture in the eyes and be a little bit rebellious. It's screaming at you. Don't take a stand against culture. It's screaming at you to be a free thinker, think for yourself. But I'm gonna take a stand and say, I'm gonna stand for God in culture, but not bow to anything or anyone but God. 
So what are we going to do? I'd say it this way. We're going to do three things. We're going to stand firm in prayer. Prayer is the act of rebellion against the work of the enemy. It's not this passive thing that we do. It's this active stand. It's not against people. It's not against culture. It's against our spiritual enemy. And Paul knew exactly what this felt like. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. Put on the full armor of God so that you can do what? You can stand against the devil's scheme. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. There it is right there. Our struggle is not against people. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There's a reality to this culture thing. There are spiritual forces at work. This is a supernatural story. There are supernatural dark forces coming against us. Therefore, because of that reality, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm. When you pray, you're going on the offensive. You're taking back territory for God and God's kingdom. We're going to stand firm in prayer. The second is, I'm going to stand for my purpose. The scheme of the enemy is to distract you just enough to make you ineffective in the lives of the people around you. He wants to keep you from doing what you were made to do. He'll whisper things to you, and you'll adapt and adopt their script. I'm not worthy. I'm not, I can't do this. I had a really bad week. I'm not equipped to do this well. But we don't stand on our own merits. We don't stand on our victories and our accomplishments and our gifts and our talents and our abilities. On our own, we're not qualified to do God's work. So we stand for God and the work he did for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, My dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. We're going to stand firm in prayer. We're going to stand for our purpose. And the last one, maybe it's obvious. We'll just say it. We're going to stand firm for God. Even if God never answered another prayer of ours, we're going to stand firm. Why? Because he stood for you. He stood firm for you. He endured the shame and humiliation and pain and heartbreak of the cross. Why? To fix the sin problem for humanity. He did it for us and he did it for them. Everyone always. That's what we're talking about next week. When we stand firm for God, we're also standing firm for others. One of our values as a church that we adopted this year was that we're going to have faith for those who don't have faith for themselves. Because watch this. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Stand up for me against world opinion, and I'll stand up for you before my Father in heaven. You want to see something really cool? I'll show you this as we get ready to close this morning. So after Jesus returns to heaven in the New Testament, kind of the words that are all used describing where Jesus is at, they talk about him being seated at the right hand of God. Colossians 3.1 is a great example. Christ is seated at the right hand of God. But we see one time in the New Testament after, uh, after Jesus ascends to heaven where Jesus stands up just like he did for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's in Acts chapter 7. It's this amazing account where the apostle Stephen becomes the first martyr. Culture tells him, you have to stop preaching Jesus. You have to stop preaching Jesus. It's wrong and you can't do it. You have to stop. He doesn't, and they wind up stoning him to death. And in his final moments, as rocks are flying at him, watch what happens in verses 55 and 56 of Acts 7. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And he told them, look, I see, this is Stephen saying this. Stephen says, look, I see the heavens open 
and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. But I would say it this way. When you stand for Jesus, when you take a stand, when you stand firm for Jesus, he stands with you. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to be a people who stand firm. I'm going to invite you, actually, would you stand with me this morning? We're going to go back and just have a a worship response moment. We're going to go back and we're going to sing about building a firm foundation, not on our accomplishments, not on our amazing personalities, not on anything, not on anything except what Jesus has done. Let's sing this song together, Build My Life. Just take a moment to just worship. Just in this moment of, of building this foundation, not standing firm on our accomplishments or our attitudes or our own righteousness, but just taking this moment to worship God and building our foundation on Him. Lord, we adore you. We love you. We just acknowledge you. We need you so much. We need your love and we need your forgiveness. We need your grace and your mercy every single day. And so right now in this moment, as we sing these words out, that we're going to build our lives on who you are, on your holiness, on the work that you've done for us and how you loved us so well. We take a stand for you. We take a stand for you. We adore you. And we're in this moment and it would be completely, completely remiss if I didn't just share this one time. So I just every every uh, head bowed, every eye closed, just this moment of reverence. Friends, if you're in this room and you, you haven't heard this story before, Jesus loves you. We're a church that's just is fully devoted to helping people find life in Jesus. And so I just say it this way, just to, to give you the two-minute simple version. Humanity has this brokenness in, of, in us. We're just diseased, broken people because of this thing called sin. And absolutely nothing is going to make us right with God except for Jesus. And this group of people here in this church, we just take a stand on what Jesus did. He went to the cross. He paid for our sins. And so now we are accepted into heaven because of what he's done. And that's it. It's nothing we've done. We haven't earned it. There's no way we could have earned it. And there's nothing we could have ever done that could help make us deserve it. It's all Jesus. And so right here, right now, this moment, you might just be feeling this, this pull. And I'll just say it's, 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 it's Jesus just pulling on your heart. He loves you. He loves you perfectly exactly where you're at. There's nothing you can do to make him love you more. And there is nothing you can do to make him love you less. He loves you. And we're standing on that fact right now. And you feel that pull. And maybe this is your moment right now where you just very simply say, Jesus, yes. I love you. I love you back. I don't even know what it means, but there's something in me that's just drawn to you and I say, I love you back. You don't need to say a prayer. You don't need to raise your hand. There's nothing you need to do just to accept in your heart what Jesus has done for you. And Lord, that is what we stand on as a church. We stand on your love and we stand on your righteousness. Lord, just help us continue to grow and be that people, that people that are going to stand stand up and stand out in a culture that wants to beat us down and knock us down and scare us to, to, into submission. But we will stand for you. We just make that our declaration as your people. We stand for you. Amen? Amen. I'm going to invite our, our elders to come forward and um, Friends, if there's something you came to church and you just need to talk with someone, there was something you needed to say to somebody this morning, I would just say our, our elders down front would love to have a conversation with you. Maybe you need prayer, a prayer for healing or a prayer for provision. Maybe there's just something going on in your life and you need just need to tell someone and have someone stand alongside you. We'd be honored to pray with you.
this morning. I want to remind you that Wednesday night, we've got our midweek, our uh, adult Bible studies. We're going through kind of verse by verse through the book of Jonah with Pastor Bruce, our youth group, our kids program, and, and come back next week. Today, we talked about stand firm. Next week, we're going to have a really, I think, a really important conversation as we learn how to love well. Would you help me just finish this out? Invite people, bring people to church, help them encounter the power of what Jesus does in culture. God bless you. Make his face shine upon you and give you peace. God bless. Have a great week, everybody.